Hey everybody, and welcome back to Submarine History. Today we're going to have a briefing on the basics and principles of radio. Why would we want to do that? Well, if you've been watching the content on this channel for a bit, or other channels related to military history, in particular naval history, at some point you'll notice that radio was a pretty big deal during World War II. Around 1900, marine radio became the first commercial application of radio technology, allowing ships to keep in touch with shore and other ships and to send out distress calls for rescue in case of emergency. During World War I, radio transmissions on land were often less reliable than using wired telephones or telegraphs, and the range was pretty short. However, at sea, radio found a foothold where ships could accommodate the large radio sets and line of sight was pretty far. By World War II, radio has been sufficiently developed that it's common in the civilian world and is in use with military ships, aircraft, and ground forces around the world. In fact, World War II is the first large-scale coordinated application of radio by nations, from the squad to the theater level in all branches of service. Radio is central to World War II. So the hope is that by watching this briefing, the next time you're reading a book, watching a movie, or listening to a lecture about military history and the subject of radio is brought up, you'll have a little better of an understanding of what's being talked about. Some background in radio will also be helpful because we'll be talking about radio facilities on submarines in an upcoming briefing. So we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the history and fundamentals of radio. There is a link in the description to this briefing to a real-time simulation of the Titanic sinking um, which includes radio transmissions between Titanic and other ships. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to see how easily communications can get confused and misunderstood in stressful situations. Read the description to this video if you can. Uh, there are other informative links. Uh, and if you have questions, please feel free to post them below in the comments. Finally, and as always, feel free to stop the briefing at any time to study a slide. Thank you to the United States Naval Institute for doing the work they do to preserve naval history from around the world. Consider supporting SNI with a membership so they may continue their mission long into the future. I do have a Discord. Uh, you should be able to grab a server invite from the link that's embedded in the banner for this channel. Our references for today. Field Manual uh, FM, and not to be confused with Frequency Module FM, but uh, FM 24-18 Tactical Single Channel Radio Communication Techniques. That is a really good reference on the basics of radio, and I think it's useful for anyone interested in radio. I've put a link in the description to the briefing where you can download for free the 1987 version of the publication. It's neat that I have the 1944 version uh, of this FM as well, and the 1987 version is like five times bigger. So that says something. Um, in this briefing, we will be using a number of illustrations and tables from that FM. Okay, so what is radio? Radio is the technology of signaling and communicating using radio waves. Radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum of frequency between 3 Hz and 300 gigahertz. Radio waves are generated by an electronic device called a radio transmitter, connected to an antenna which radiates the waves that are received by another antenna connected to a radio receiver. Who invented radio? In 1865, Scottish mathematician James Maxwell demonstrated that electric and magnetic fields travel through space as waves moving at the speed of light. He proposed that light is an undulation in the same medium that is the cause of electric and magnetic phenomena. The unification of light and electrical phenomena led to his prediction of the existence of radio waves. In 1887, German physicist Heinrich Hertz first conclusively proved the existence of the electromagnetic or radio waves predicted by James Clark Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. In 1895, Guillermo Marconi, an Italian inventor and electrical engineer, created the first practical radio wave-based wireless telegraph system in 1895. This led Marconi being credited as the inventor of radio, and he shared the 1909 Nobel Prize in Physics with Carl Ferdinand Braun. Marconi was a businessman as well as an inventor, and he parlayed his radio creation into the 
Wireless Telegraph and Signal Company in 1897. His company initially supplied radio sets to the passenger ship industry, like Titanic, and a number of the ships at sea the night Titanic sank had radio rooms supplied with Marconi radios and Marconi radio operators. So how does radio actually work? Power is applied to an oscillator and a buffer which, through mechanical or electric electronic means, generates a precise radio wave at a specific frequency. This is our carrier wave. To that carrier wave, audio or pulse information is applied via a modulator device. This modulated carrier wave is then amplified and sent out through an antenna to the world. On the receiving end, uh, and they don't show a power supply in this figure, but it would have been there powering all these components. Radio waves of all frequencies are being picked up by the antenna. The frequency detector, or demodulator, filters out all the frequencies except the one that we're interested in. The leftover frequency, the frequency we, we want, is then demodulated. The carrier wave is stripped out, leaving us the audio or pulse information, which is amplified and sent to a speaker so we can hear it. Today, it's common for the transmitter, the receiver, amplification, and tuner functions to be built into a single package called the transceiver. However, in World War II, the miniaturization of radio components was in its infancy, so it was common to see a number of big boxes in a radio room on a ship representing different kinds of transmitters, receivers, amplifiers, tuners, etc. This is what a radio wave looks like. It's a sine wave that has an amplitude, a wavelength, and a frequency. Amplitude is the height of the radio wave from the peak or trough to the center line of the wave and is measured in meters. Wavelength is the distance from peak to peak or trough to trough and is also measured in meters. The frequency is the number of times the wavelength is repeated per unit time, usually one second. In the early days, frequency was referred to as cycles per second before being renamed the Hertz in honor of Heinrich Hertz in 1930. So as I indicated uh, in an earlier slide, radio waves represent one portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio represents the lower frequency range of the electromagnetic spectrum from 3 hertz to 300 gigahertz. Above 300 gigahertz, we get into the infrared light spectrum, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays. What this chart shows us is that during World War II, the vast majority of radio communication was occurring in the VHF band and lower. Radar, which was around at the start of World War II, mostly used frequencies in the UHF and SHF bands with a little overlap in the VHF frequency range. I've added in on this chart the AM and FM broadcast bands. Uh, those are the bands we all know and love from our car radios. Uh, frequency management by nations was very important, so military use didn't interfere with civilian use. So radio wavelength is inversely proportional to radio frequency. As the frequency gets higher, the wavelength gets smaller. One equation is wavelength in meters equals 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. So let's, uh, let's do a little calculation here. On April 15, 1912, the Titanic transmitted Morse code distress messages on the 600 meter band. What was the corresponding frequency and which part of the radio spectrum was the transmitter using? So what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange the equation so we solve for frequency. And in this case, frequency in megahertz is going to equal 300 divided by the wavelength in meters. When we do this calculation, we come out to 0 0.5 megahertz, which is 500 kilohertz. Or back in World War II, we would have said 500 uh, kilocycles, possibly. Titanic's transmitter was operating in the medium frequency range of the radio spectrum and just below the AM broadcast band. During World War II, that 500 kilohertz frequency, uh, the center point of that 600 meter band, was the international civilian shipping distress frequency, and U-boats would have monitored that frequency uh, during the war, in part to see if civilian targets radioed for help when attacked. In the movie The Final Countdown, there was a scene just after the USS Nimitz goes through the Time War portal uh, and the ship 
staff is trying to figure out you know what is going on in that scene the cic reports to the bridge that they are picking up coded messages on the 200 meter band the 200 meter band corresponds to 1500 kilohertz which is actually in the am broadcast band so how could that be because only commercial signals should be transmitted in that 540 to 1700 kilohertz kilohertz range uh, so I looked into this, and what I found was that at the start of World War II, there was a reorganization of the AM broadcast band, and there actually were frequencies around 1,500 kilohertz that were not assigned for commercial use. So we could interpret that, that they were reserved for military use. Um, so it's possible that military coded messages could have been sent in that band. So good job to the writers there. The intensity of radio waves over distance obeys the inverse square law which states that intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from a source. Double the distance and you get four times less power. Okay, so here's a table that tries to put uh, into perspective this idea of radio power and distance. This table represents the radio frequency bands that would have been associated with voice and Morse code during World War II. On the left, we have our frequency bands, in the middle, we have the range associated with each band uh, and the typical range of power required uh, on the right. At the HF band and lower, we get sky wave propagation of radio waves. We'll talk about that more in a sec. There is potentially a little sky wave propagation for VHF under certain conditions, but mostly VHF and UHF waves are absorbed by, or excuse me, are absorbed by the ionosphere. They're not reflected. So ground wave propagation is what we associate with line of sight. And in general, that's VHF and UHF. This picture kind of ties it all together with range. Um, this picture could represent the transmission of HF radio waves. There is a ground wave propagation that attenuates or dissipates over distance based on a lot of conditions. In addition to ground wave propagation, the transmitted radio waves shoot skyward and are reflected by the ionosphere back down to Earth where a ping-pong effect takes place. This is how radio waves can go halfway around the world, and this is what would have made long-range communication possible in World War II. They didn't have satellites. Uh, they had to rely on this propagation effect to communicate long distances. In the movie uh, In Harm's Way, there is a scene where Captain Eddington has taken a PBJ, which is a P, uh, B-25, on a one-way unauthorized mission to try to locate a Japanese invasion force. Headquarters tries to establish voice comms with Eddington, but in the scene, the radio operator has trouble uh, getting good radio reception because Eddington is so far away. The radio operator instructs Eddington to switch to a secondary frequency where hopefully the signal will be better. And this is accurate. The ionosphere behaves uh, differently during the day versus the night because of the influence of the sun, so it would have been standard operating procedures for there to be a number of different hailing communication frequencies spread out throughout the HF band. Okay, so we've talked about what a radio is, uh, how they send signals out, and what part of the electromagnetic spectrum they use. But how do we actually send Morse code or a person's voice over the air? So let's take a minute and talk about the four different types of signal modulation available during the war. We'll start with the modulation types we're familiar with today, which is amplitude modulation, or AM, and frequency modulation, or FM. These modulation types are still in use today, and every time you get in your car and turn on the radio, you're listening to a broadcast sent over the air, either using amplitude or frequency modulation. In general, Amplitude mod modulation is more efficient than frequency modulation, but frequency modulation produces a better, clear signal. Looking at this figure, uh, what we see is that we start with a carrier wave. We apply our voice or Morse code signal to that carrier through the modulator. And what happens is that either the amplitude of the carrier wave is modulated or its frequency. This is reversed at the radio receiver and our Morse code or voice signal is stripped out of the carrier wave and then we can hear it. We've talked about AM and FM modulation. There is another type of modulation called continuous wave, which is used for Morse code. This is as simple as sending signals gets. 
We either have a signal present at the fixed frequency for a unit of time, or we don't. We set a frequency, and when we depress the Morse code keyer, it completes a circuit and sends out a steady state signal for either one unit or three units of time, depending if it's a dot or a dash. And the operator physically controls that. The fourth type of signal modulation used in World War II would have been single sideband for voice. AM signals have a peak, but they also have some signal just above and below the baseline frequency. What we're doing with single sideband is sending a voice signal using half the total frequency. So it's more efficient than FM, but the quality of the voice isn't quite what it would be with FM. However, this would have been the standard way to send voice long distance with radio in World War II. So to wrap it up, it's possible that we could have four pairs of radios on a given frequency, each radio pair using a different type of modulation, and no radio pair would understand anything the other pairs were transmitting. All right, enough about radios. Let's talk about antennas. We have two types of antennas, horizontally aligned or horizontally polarized or vertically aligned or vertically polarized. There are pros and cons to each type of antenna and each has a situation. The classical horizontally polarized antenna is called a dipole. This horizontal antenna is represented by a horizontal length of wire, which is one half the length of the radio frequency being transmitted, and it's further broken down into two one quarter halves that work together. In the center of this horizontally polarized antenna, that T point, is the feed line from our radio. So if we wanted to transmit on 10 meters HF, in theory, we would want a dipole antenna that was 5 meters long with two halves, each 2.5 meters in length. So here's an example of a field expedient horizontal dipole antenna in the field. And here is another example of a field expedient horizontal dipole antenna. Uh, this is a scene from We Were Soldiers. In this scene, the troops are stateside training when the radio operator gets out his portable HF radio and strings up a horizontal dipole antenna in the trees. He's able to tune in and listen on the fighting in Vietnam. Uh, to the right of him, there appears to be a private who's installing a whip antenna on what is probably a VHF antenna. A little more relevant to us, uh, here is the U995, and we can see wires extending from the conning tower to the bow into uh, the stern of the boat. These, these are HF antennas that could be used in different combinations for different purposes. Um, next time you're in game with World of Warships, take a look at a ship in port and see all the horizontally strung wires between the mass of a given ship. Those are mostly, if not all, radio antennas. So in addition to horizontal dipole antennas, we also have vertical monopole antennas. These are mostly associated with VHF or UHF communication, but you can use vertical monopoles with HF radios. Really, what a monopole antenna is, it's a horizontal dipole antenna stood on its end. And we only use half of that dipole, or a quarter of it. Ideally, we have a radio that is communicating on a set frequency, and we have an antenna with a length to match that frequency either one half or one quarter the length of our signal, depending if we're using horizontal or vertical uh, polarization. What do you do, though, if your radio needs to transmit over a wide range of frequencies, but you only have one antenna of fixed length for your radio? Common bands to transmit on in the HF portion of the spectrum range from 10 to 160 meters, and that's a huge range of frequencies to cover with a single antenna. In that case, to improve poor radioception or transmission, we can use an antenna tuner that tries to correct the, elect the electrical imbalances between the radio, our frequency, and the antenna to give us a good signal. Okay, so let's wrap it up uh, by talking about radio nets for a second. A radio net is three or more radio stations communicating with each other for a common purpose on a shared frequency. A radio net has a moderator who initiates the group communication uh, who ensures all participants follow the standard procedures, and who determines and directs when each other station may talk. The moderator is the, in the radio net is called the net control station, formerly abbreviated NCS. Radio nets and the orderly control of them is critical in a wartime environment.
So that's it for today. Uh, if you've enjoyed this briefing and want to know more about radios, or if you have questions as a result of this briefing, post your questions below in the comments and I'll try to answer them. If there's a lot of interest in the fundamentals of radio, I'm happy to do a Radio 201 briefing to dive in some aspects in more detail. Until then, everybody stay safe and peace out.